Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Scotty Jeanette Madden. They're a late stage trans woman, having been a husband of 26 years. Scotty Jeanette is also an author and works in the television industry. So lots of things going on. And I'm excited to have Scotty here today. So Scotty, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, uh, first of all, Sarah, thanks for having me. Um, uh, And you're having me on the eve of Transgender Day of Visibility. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, Although this show will probably be posted after that. Um, Not a lot of people know what TDAV is, but it is the the, it's the antithetical in the calendar year of TDOR, which is Transgender Day of Remembrance. And that's a very solemn day where we remember transgender uh, siblings that we lost due to murder, as we call it, uh, death by trans, uh, for being trans. Um, and so Transgender Day of Visibility is a day where we celebrate our visibility. So thanks for having me for this. Um, I Let's see. I did this last night speaking to a Jewish retir- retirement homes, and I think I honed it down to pretty, to at least get to get to your questions. <laughs> I um, had been married for 20 years um, when um, all of the defense mechanisms that I had built around myself since the age of four to protect myself Uh, Because my um, experience had been that when I expressed any kind of, uh, I didn't know them to be feminine traits. I thought they were my traits. (laughs) Um, As a four-year-old, I got hurt uh, by a family friend who was protecting my father. Um, Didn't want Jim's chip off the old block to be a sissy boy. So... um, I learned pretty quickly, don't do that, because it hurts when you do it. And um, uh, then as I started to get older, I started to realize whenever I wanted to act on my natural instincts, um, how it hurt. It would piss people off. My life would get really bad. Um, And I'm saying it in this way because people always ask, like, "At at what age did you know you were a girl? And it's really... Like, at what age did I know I should never tell anybody I was a girl? That's really how my experience went. Um, So I got further and further down that track and journey of life, um, got props when I did things that were, quote unquote, boy things, um, and learned pretty quickly not to do the girl things, because as I started to develop my intelligence, I realized I didn't know how to transition. I didn't know I could transition, didn't know what that was. I was confused as to why I was made this way. I didn't have anybody to talk about it. And I didn't have anybody talking about it in my world. Um, I'm going to be 60 this year. So that'll kind of help you place a little context around things. You know, I had grown up in the era when uh, Renee Richards uh, came out very publicly wanting to be a professional tennis player on the women's tennis circuit and was eviscerated by the news, by late night comedians. Um, uh, Poor woman. Thank God. I mean, she went on to be a very strong advocate uh, for our community. Um, uh, But she went, she crawled, had to crawl through broken glass to get there. And that was not certainly not fair. Um, So I didn't know, how to do that, especially since I wasn't good at tennis. You know? um, and I truly never thought I would ever come out. I mean, I really, I didn't have the language. I knew it was a hurricane of emotion and um, trauma that I would experience every month. About once a month, it, I would lose about three days of my life of trying to hold myself together from exploding and that was all because of, I had wrapped myself in so many different defense mechanisms to protect myself that they were all clashing and I didn't know it. But I muddled through and I started to thrive in life despite all this going on. And I had an, an unbelievable marriage. 
And um, it wasn't until I had one of these monthly bouts of what I now know is dysphoria that it lasted for two weeks. And that's when I started to panic. Um, it didn't mean I was going to do anything about it. I was just in now mortal fear. This wasn't ending the way it normally did. It didn't pass after the three, four days that would uh, help. So I, um, I woke up at the foot of our bed holding two cups of coffee with my wife saying, awful early for coffee. And it was 5 a.m. And I didn't know how I got there. Didn't know who made the coffee. Obviously, I must have because she was still in bed. And I blurted all of what I told you, but in far more passionate and or confusing and or horrifying to both of us uh, depictions and descriptions. That started, I couldn't get it back. I was trying to take it back, even if it was coming out of my mouth. <laughs> and that changed our our marriage. I will happy to say, and this is what the subject of my first book and and Marcy's book was about, um, was that once we were able to undo all of the societal and familial and adopted um, notions about what gender and and what those gender roles are in a marriage. We had a gold star marriage. We had a marriage that had inspired others to get married. Um, so once we were able to undo all this other crap on the outside, that was what our fears were based on. We were able to figure out that love was our handrail and we, we made it through. And so it was a five year period from that time when I came out to the time that I fully came out to the world. And I hadn't done anything, acted on it at all during that time. It was just us trying to figure out what does this mean to our marriage and what does this really mean? The biggest obstacle was actually mine, was when I said to Marcy, I am a woman, which was the first words that flew out of my mouth when I was holding those cups of coffee, she heard, I'm leaving you. And I didn't know that in the first two or three years of our trying to deal with this, it didn't ever click on me that that was what was at the seed of this. And once I was like, whoa, 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 this isn't about that. I'm not leaving you. I'm just trying to figure out how to live our life. I, even at that point, I didn't know what it meant when I, when I blurted all this out. I didn't know what I wanted. And, it, well, you know, in a loving relationship, you want what each other, well, you want what the other person wants for themselves. You want that for yourself in the worst way. And so I realized if I could figure that out, then of course Marcy would help me be, do that and be that. Once we got past the idea that that would mean us doing it separately. So we completely restructured our marriage from the inside out. We had to relearn intimacy, but we did. We did all these things. Um, incidentally, three months after this morning coffee clatch that we had, um, Marcy was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And so I didn't know this until she was able to articulate this many years later, because what I did at that time when she was diagnosed was like, who cares about me? It's about you. We need to solve cancer. And that's where she realized that it was love that we were dealing with and not 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 any of these fantasies in our or you know horror stories in our heads that we've been told all of our life is what transition is so a positive story <laughs> um to start off after years and and years of telling yourself no i can't do that and then waking up in the middle of the night making coffee <laughs> <laughs> so since then coming out publicly beyond Marcy, what has changed in your life? Well, uh, um, you know, virtually everything. Um, one of the things that, you know, Mars 
we, we fought ovarian cancer for nine years and then Marcy passed away in 2018. So one thing that's changed is that the support structure that I had is gone. Um, you know, thank God she made me a strong woman. <laughs> um, but I'm now trying to, if I'm out looking for love, you know, it took me a good two years of just being completely hermetically sealed in my own grief that I'm only now starting to look around. So that's certainly changed. What also has changed is that the temperature of the country has changed in really dramatic but confusing ways. Um, you know, I didn't ha ever have the language uh, being able to discuss what I was and was going through. But we're hearing stories today of children who are four years old who know exactly who they are and they're, you know, the, and that's the thing is like this, the, the, the right, the Republican, they should think we need a different word than right, because that makes it sound like they're correct and they're anything, but, you know, it makes it sound like you can program somebody, honey, there's no way you can go through transition unless it's really for you. It's too hard. There's, it takes too long. It's, it's too it's too mind blowing. You know, the, 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 the analogy I always use is I have a friend of mine who's gay. And one of the ways that they treat prostate cancer is they give men uh, estrogen. Now, he's gay. He's only into men, right? Um, he's very masculine man. He wanted to commit suicide on estrogen. It was the worst thing ever. His emotions. He was like, I have emotions. I don't know what to do. Right. This is a, a gay man. So he wasn't cliched, toxic, masculine. He was, a, this was, you know, and, and yet you gave estrogen to me and I finally got oxygen after, you know, 48 years of life. So if that doesn't tell you something right there about what's going on biologically for people who want to keep throwing that out there, then you know, I don't know what to tell you. You know, uh, when I started my medical transition, you know, for me, the first steps were, and this is odd, and I say this about my book, I was being considered to be the showrunner for uh, taking one republic through the Middle East. And I was like, this is right after I transitioned. So I was like, I got to get my passport changed because <laughs> if it says M on there, I'm toast. Those people will lock my ass up, right? So I was like, well, I've got to get that gender marker changed. And I went down. And then that was the first time I considered that I would change my name. I hadn't even thought that that was a possibility either. You know, I. It, this sounds weird, but I know that I snuck up on the actual process of transitioning because I didn't want it to elude me. But also, I didn't want to reach for it until it could happen for real. I've always been a very practical person. As much as I deal in fantasy and, and narrative as a writer, um, I don't go after something unless I can do it, right? Um, so getting my gender marker changed on my passport was the number one thing. So that was 2014, 15 is when that happened. I, then once I got started on hormones, dysphoria and the, the hijacker is what I actually called it because I didn't have the name dysphoria for it, went away. Then the triggering of dysphoria went completely away when I had gender-affirming surgery. Just gone. Like it, and, and also the software that was connected to it was gone too. So all I had was remnants of weird you know, impressions or um, thoughts that I used to connect together, those were kind of still floating like free radicals in my psyche and awareness. But, but the things that triggered them and the thing and the pain that they caused was completely gone. That's the other thing is like, it's so easy to solve someone's life problem by the gender affirming surgeries and all the other modalities that we have we didn't just invent them we're not the ones who invented them you know doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists they got together and figured out how do we help people and it works and now it's the one thing that you know 
everybody wants to take away. And I think what they think in their this, I, I mean, I can't figure out what the end game is, but if it is, if there is an end game, it's like, we'll all go away. What? We'll leave Utah because we can't swim in sports anymore. We'll leave Texas because our parents have been investigated for child abuse. So we'll go to California. What? I, I don't understand. I don't understand what they think. We're not going away. So what would be the point of persecuting us? I don't, I don't get it. I don't either. I am right there with you. So since you mentioned work, what is like, what? Cause like, obviously big thing that you were up for right after transitioning. So what has changed in the workforce for you since transitioning ah. or during that time? You know, if you'd asked me this question uh, even a year ago, I would have had a different answer. But when I, when I first came out, I had six interviews and got none of them. I had been one of the top adventure survival reality showrunners. And I started to hear it would be up for those jobs. And then I would appear with a far better hairstyle and a little bit of eyeliner and some lipstick, and better wardrobe. And they would be like, you're not the dude on your resume. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah. And then we would get have these phenomenal conversations about my transition, but I wouldn't get the gig. And when I would call up the follow-up, it would be like, yeah, well, we found someone a little bit more qualified. I'm like, well, I'd like to meet this girl because I know everybody who's as qualified as me, and they're all busy. So I don't think you're being truthful. Well, it's not us. It's that we're afraid the crews that you would lead would have a problem with you. And I'm like, the crews that I have been hired and have dragged all over the world, kept them safe in the jungles of Guyana, the hills of Alaska in winter, mountaintops in Iceland. Is that what you mean? Those people, you think those people are not going to follow me because I wear lipstick to the set now? Let's be real. That's not true. So uh, it, that was really a difficult thing to do. It wasn't until last July that I produced another show. And I produced an, a series for Netflix with a dear friend of mine as a showrunner. Uh, and she called me up because she knew I was the most qualified and my resume was the most qualified and I was hired because I was the most qualified for that position, um, as I should be. But it took a woman crew. It took a woman, a, a woman headed show to have that. And that's, that is a little disturbing that, um, that men have a real issue with that. Um, but they're the ones who want to go good for you. You're so courageous. You know, that's fantastic. I will tell you that one thing that surprised me was that we had as the heads of the department uh, of this show, um, you know, that had a male director, had a male director of photography and had a male, um, head engineer who was the one who controlled all of our robotic cameras and stuff like that. Um, and they were very respectful and very polite um, because I had to be in a position of authority to kind of direct them and move them through their day. Um, and it wasn't until the rap party that I realized what a stir I had caused. I, I had no issues while we were shooting. Everybody was, as I said, very respectful. We, we did our jobs. We got home. We brought the show home. It was good. <laughs> But at the rap party, the head engineer came up to me and said, by the way, I saw your TED talk. I'm like, you did? He goes, yeah, it was in the link in your, in your signature. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's true. I, you know, I just sent out emails on a daily basis, probably hundreds. Um, and that was in my signature. And I've, it's one of those things I've kind of forgotten that I did. And he goes, yeah, it was really powerful. But I'll tell you what, I, when I saw that, I thought, Wow this woman could end my career if I say the wrong thing. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't, 
I had to really dig in and figure out what was he saying. And there is a fear amongst a lot of men today, particularly when there is a significant female presence in the workforce alongside of them, which is getting better in TV. We're not anywhere near parity, but we're working. We're at least striving for it. Um. He knew not to say it out loud, but he was truly fearful of it. And that was mind blowing to me that, that I, you know, I, I didn't, I'm still not exactly sure what to do with that. Uh, part of me is like, good, don't mess up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but anyways, we got through it without any incidents. And pre transition, like pre where you weren't being hired for things, were the crews that you were in mostly men? Yeah, I I come from a very male end of the spectrum. Uh, in the you know often adventure survival, normally we're, you know the the two last shows I did for before I fully came out was Dude You're Screwed and Land Rush, and they both had they're both you know um, way out in the wilderness, you know, Deidre Screwed featured a military grade, a military pedigree and grade survival cast. Each one of them were, you know, we had a Navy SEAL and a Green Beret and a Royal Air Force SEER instructor. And, and then we had a couple of revolving slots. We always carried five guys and these guys would get together and they would kidnap one of them and some, you know, Jason Bourne ripoff of a action sequence blindfold him, handcuff him, and drop him somewhere in the world by helicopter, and then give him 100 hours to get back to civilization while they watched him smoking cigars and drinking whiskey and laughing at how good or bad he solved whatever particular thing he was facing in the jungle. So, um, yeah, it had a lot of men on the cast. However, my my go-to you know people on the ca- on the crew that helped me get the show done were all women. Like I had, you know, my best field producer was a woman. My best production manager, line producer was a woman. And we were the, we were the brain trust behind getting these boys being boys, uh, you know, around the world with the ultimate camping (laughs) show. So, um, you know, uh, however, they didn't know I was a girl. They, they, you know, that, and that was where my dysphoria was at its, you know, nitrous fuel worst. Um, I was always afraid of even taking my top off. We went swimming in every place we went, but it was always with a bunch of guys around. And I just was like, I'm not comfortable (laughs) being topless around these dudes. And I hadn't shown, I wasn't showing or anything, but it was still just a weird thing, you know? Um, And they had no idea what was going on. And it was just, it was complicated. Dysphoria produces a whole bunch of really just bizarre and complicated and traumatic feelings and thoughts while it's happening. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, very, it was the testosterone side of the swimming pool, if you will. Yeah. So what got you into the adventure survival side of television? Well, I, I was, you know, I'm in the mountains that I was re- actually raised in. I'm back here, uh, you know, riding the pandemic out. Because um, Hollywood's still trying to figure out what it wants to be when it grows up. So I can get there in 90 minutes. But I've always been an outdoor girl. I, you know, when I was really, um, what's odd is, and I'm kind of going through this right now. I, before I had a car, I used to run everywhere up here on the mountain to get to my friend's house. And it was always through the woods because it's faster than running along the roads. Roads don't go in a very direct (laughs) fashion up here. And the woods was where I, the only place that made sense to me, especially with dysphoria. Um, I could just get out there and get away and, and it didn't stop the dysphoria, but at least I didn't have any other distractions around me. And I had the, the embrace of the trees. Um, now being back here after all these years and on the other side of transition i don't know these roads i know them i know where they go i know how to get from here to there but when i'm going down them they're not the familiar comfort that i had they're beautiful they are comforting because being in nature is always comforting but um 
but I I'm different walking down them, and I'm and I'm really aware of that. It's kind of a it's a unique experience to be confronting with real focus and attention what it's like to be on the other side of dysphoria. Um, but because I had become so good at being in the woods, it meshed with my skills, uh, having studied television at San Diego State. And I always wanted to be doing outdoor. It, I started as a camera operator. Um, and then I started going all around the world with Surfer Magazine. I was working for a show based on the magazine. And the production company was out of Del Mar. Hi, Ira. Hi, Jimmy. Um, and they, I was the only employee of a of a small business that was owned by two men. And Ira was the one who was the surfer, and he actually sold a show to ESPN based on the magazine. So I was the camera operator that went all over the world with him. And then I then I became the editor that edited all that stuff together. And so I got really good at getting people and equipment in and out of not first world countries because some of the best surf in the world is in not third world is not the right word for it, but certainly not a international airport that anybody would recognize the initials on their luggage. So my, that side of my resume started getting bigger and bigger and bigger because some, once people found out that I was good at that part of it, of, of not only being able to work in the, extreme outdoors situation and bring home great pictures. But I also knew how to do that. I knew how to get our gear through customs and through carnets and all of the ins and outs of international production that I couldn't get away from it. Then my resume just got bigger and bigger and bigger, you know? And so what's odd though, uh, in retrospect, and I've discovered this with several of my trans girlfriends is that, my friend Allie calls it the last gasp of, of masculinity. And it's like we, even Kristen Beck, who, you know, wrote um, Lady Valor. Did she write Lady Valor? It's about her. That's the film that's about it. And she, um, Warrior Princess. So she was a Navy SEAL, 14 tours of duty in Afghanistan. The real and the seals don't just go there and hang out, right? <laughs> they go, they they go to work in seal way, right? So we, for some reason, with late stage um, trans girls, especially, there's this last push of, and and I can't, I don't think it's like I wasn't doing it to, or right, I'm going to give it one last shot. It was like it's you be because of your circumstances in our lives, we got better at and more experienced and more sometimes more pay, which in my case, for doing what was deemed to be male presenting things. Um, and, you know, I was hanging out with these guys and they were respecting me because they, I was leading them around the world and I had my, my feces cohesive. I wasn't an idiot. And I, what always had their back, um, which is not true in a TV show. Sometimes the showrunner and the cast are at complete odds, but I never understood that, you know? So I had their respect. So I got better and better and better at that. And so you get more opportunities to do that, but it's the one thing that's dragging me further away from what I really am. Um, and that's a weird fantasy because it's also not true. Let's I'm, I'm gonna be real about that. I mean, one of my dearest friends and the one woman who actually taught me the most about being a showrunner, she was in the Ar the Antarctic with whale wars. She was on the decks of the ships in Deadliest Catch. She's as badass as they as they come as a showrunner. So it's not that it's a male that does it. Okay, so I, I want to make that clear. Um, and she was the one that I was like, no, I'm, I'm following Monica, she said, but Monica does it right. You know, that's the showrunner I'm going to be when I was coming up and I was her number two for a many, for many shows. So, but it, but it, it's how the individual person relates to that, you know, that, that makes it that crazy last hurrah, which, you know, tends to make it very dramatic when you go, ah, surprise, 
<laughs> you know, and we don't mean to be surprised. Like that's weird because the last thing we want to do is draw more attention to us because we've been fighting that attention or the fear of that attention is what keeps many of us in the closet when we get close to that. Now, you know, as again, I, as I said, I, I tiptoe up at these things and, and kind of sneak around them because I had built so many layers of denial around it that I didn't even know that, well, if I just transitioned, I would be okay. If I just came out, I would be okay. I was like, no, if, if someone finds out I'm dead, that's what it had become inside of me. And that was just my own flavor. I don't, that's not how other people who are facing coming out are, but that's how I was. And I, and I will lose everything. I will lose Marcy, which is, you know, but even the articulation of coming out was something that didn't happen till the very last part, you know, of it, because I had, again, clouded it with like, don't even look over here at this because it will just, it's, you know, there be dragons, <laughs> you know, don't go there. Um, and so I knew to stay away from that handrail, you know, for the, or third rail, actually, uh, all my life. And did any of those fears come to any sort of fruition? You know, uh, only in the meta, you know, um, uh, the, I, I have, well, even the cast from Dude, You're Screwed. I, I was very formal and, and came out to all of them. And Terry, who was the Green Beret, he was active duty Green Beret at the time, said, oh, we got you. And he called the network and he said, just in case you're wondering, we're with her. So that fear uh, did not come to fruition. Um, but that doesn't stop these states trying to nibble. And trust me, I'm past be participating in collegiate sports. Okay. And, and it's not... It's, it is my compassion for the girls, which is, that's the other thing that's bizarre about the anti-trans bills uh, for sports, is they only state by name when trans women. They don't even say anything about the trans men, right? They state trans girls or, you know, you know it's like, what? You're not even allowed to do that. That's, that, that violates all of our, you know, Title IX issues. And it's like, it's just crazy. But. Um, aside from my compassion, what we have to see is that this little nibbling, this, this chink that they want to get their teeth into is the open door for discrimination against all. That's what it is. It's not just discrimination against transgender people. It's discrimination against anybody who isn't a white man. And that's the, that's the not so not so secret, dirty secret. That's what they want. They're just, they want to get some sort of a foothold in there. They want to do something in there to come against us. And I don't know why they want to come against us, by the way, except that it's, it's very clear that when you raise the, the specter of the transgender people being everywhere, then the donations into their war chest goes up and the donations in Christian churches goes up and they talk about it. Combat that, you know. I it, so it's uh, we're we're a good money maker, and we should probably be charging the Christian Church. <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about what your TED Talk was that uh, brought fear into your one coworker? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give you the link to it. Uh, what I did is I I, I wanted to um, I wanted to talk about two things that were really important to my journey experience. And number one is that I had been given actually the tools all along by my parents to be who I was, even though I was afraid that that would be the issue. One of the biggest things that was instilled in fear with me with the person who made it very plain I should never uh, let anybody know I was a girl when I was four years old. Um, that was the fear was like, what would your father say? You know, and he really brought down the idea that whatever I was was so shameful that it would, it would 
destroy the love between my father and I. And what I wanted to, I, I, and this is weird. So let me see if I can dissect it. And again, this is just for me. It's I'm please don't apply this to anybody else, but I had become complicit in my own imprisonment because I let somebody else tell me and make me fearful of a bond that I had with my father, which I'm the only person who knows my side of that bond. And my father was the only person who knew the other side, truly. As much as my mother and father were in lockstep about everything about raising us, it was very beautiful that way. But my mother knew how much my father and I loved each other. My mother knew how much I loved her and she loved me. For me to let anybody into that sacred bond, that's on me. Ultimately, um, I don't kick myself for it. But what I wanted to do was show that that I had come to that also. I had unwound that knot through the course of my journey. And realizing that what what, what would my father say? He would say, I love you. Because he was my father. And he loved me. And for me to... To let someone else tell me otherwise was is the part that I want us all to be strong about. And and if there's something that I can give to another person looking at coming out is like, I learned a really strange lesson in many different variations of that through worrying about someone as I was coming out to them. I was supposing what their feeling, what their heart was going to be like instead of letting them Tell me what their heart was like. My friend Ronnie, who uh, I produced a, a horror movie with, you can see the poster behind me here, <laughs> The Kiss. Um, he, uh, we went to dinner, Mars and I, and he and his wife Val. And I didn't come out in the dinner, but I was definitely very feminine at dinner. I had huge hoop earrings and my hair up and. And he was used to me seeing me like not be the, you know, rrr, rrr, male dude that he was. But um, but on the way home, Val was like, what's going on with Scotty? And Ronnie was like, I don't know. What do you mean? So I get a call 30 minutes after we hug them goodbye after this dinner at a Thai restaurant. And he goes, hey, Val says that something's going on with you. So I want to know is something going on. I'm like, kind of. You know, he goes, well, how long has this been going on? So I completely came out to him, you know, with no uncertain terms. And he said, why didn't you tell me before? Like, he was angry. Like, our friendship is better. You should have told me about this when when you were going through. I could have helped you. But I'm like, <laughs> wow. So this is about you all of a sudden. You know? And what I love is he was pure of heart. He really was. He, we, nothing was going to change, but, oh, but a lot has changed. Let's be real, because he's he's a very dude, dude, and so he's he's learned that I don't really never cared about dick jokes and fart jokes as much as he did, you know, uh, among other things. So, um, but it was something that you know kind of goes to the point I'm trying to make, which is you you once you decide what somebody else is going to have in their heart you've done them a disservice and and as queer people we then we we start off making the conversation a little bit weird that has to be recovered from right where we could just say look i know you love me and we've had all these this incredible bond together um here's something that you haven't really known about me and be fully, and this is what I learned with Mars. It's like Marcy kept saying, why are you so sure I'm not going to leave? And I'm like, because I, because we have this incredible marriage. Of course I'm sure you're not going to leave because I know you, just like you know me. Like, well, I didn't know that you were trans. I'm like, well, that's okay, but that's not who who I am. That's a thing about me, but you know who I am. And she was like, God, God you're right. <laughs> I want to be mad right now, but I can't be, you know. So it taught me, you know, that, that, that we needed to do that. The other thing I wanted to do with my TED Talk is that I wanted to use a completely different language for describing 
particularly gender dysphoria, because so many of the phrases in talking about the trans experience uh, lose their lose their meaning. You know, uh, gender dysphoria is described as the discomfort you have from an incongruence between your identity and your body. I was like, well, no, <laughs> that's not what dysphoria is. Dysphoria is a hurricane of fire and broken glass that shreds your body and your psyche every time you feel it. That's how gnarly it is. That's why the medical community does everything they can to help us fix that. So I wanted to change those words. You know, I, one of my biggest pet peeves is like, well, now that you're living your authentic life, I'm like, my authentic life. <laughs> if I was living my authentic life, I would be in that castle sitting on my pink throne, bitch, you know, but uh, I'm, we're all doing the best we can. Um, it's when we come out that we, we, we needed some word that described that. But when you say authentic life, it makes it sound like you were inauthentic before. And you weren't inauthentic. It was, it's a super complicated thing. You know, Marcy would say to me, well, this was a pretty big thing to hide from me. I'm like, I didn't hide this from you or from anybody. I never thought the world would learn it. But there are 360 degrees of a human being. And you're telling me that I didn't tell you about this over here when there's all this other stuff that you're going to get to know about me that we'll never, you'll never learn all this about me in a year. So how do you think I held this one thing back from you? That's not that's not even correct or accurate or realistic. So there's so much to know about a person that that's what makes up a human. That's why we're so it's lovely creatures as we have these dimensions. So I wanted to find a different way of describing that so that people who were trying to understand the transgender journey would have an idea about it. So that's why I made the TED Talk. Long answer. <laughs> Yeah, but I think, you know, what you're saying is exactly right with the different verbiage that's used and the reality of what people experience. So were your parents around for when you transitioned? No, no, they were not. Um, one of the, my mother passed away at the age of 42. I was a um, sophomore in college and my father passed away. He was the age, he was 57 when he passed um, about 17, yeah, about 17 years before I transitioned. So, um, that's a, it's a, it's a thought experiment. You know, there's so many times when people say, do you wish you had transitioned earlier? I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm also glad I did now. You know, um, it's really, that's a, such a strange thought experiment and that's all it really is. It's a thought experiment, you know? Um, Marcy and I used to argue about this all the time. She thought, you know, your, your father would have had a problem with this. I'm like, I, I wouldn't have let him have a problem with this. I wouldn't have. I mean, that was our, our relationship. It was like, you know, he would spout off something bizarre in the world. And I'm like, you're out of your mind. You're high, you know, and we would come to an agreement about something. Um, he held on to some really weird things. Like he really likes Willie Nelson. And no shade on Willie, but who can listen to that 24 hours a day? I'm sorry. I need more variety. <laughs> but, so I wouldn't have let him. And he he wouldn't have let him, you know? Um, so I, but, but again, that's a thought experiment, you know? Um, it's a valuable one, particularly when you're talking about your parent, because it really makes you get in touch with, you know, what is your love for your parent? Is it is it intellectual? Is it like, well, of course we're in love. It's my parent, you know, or are you, have you really gone inside? You know, the one thing about being transgender and, and coming out is that, and I think this is why we scare the shit out of cisgender people is because we know who we are. If you transition, you have, you're, you're tested by fire and many cis people will never get tested in their life. They hope that they're this person. They think they might be this person or their ego says, of course, you're that person. But we know it because we've been tested. So we know what's in our hearts. You know, um, 
we that's why we're we become really good at deciding you know is this person valuable to be in my life anymore and that's a hard one when you're talking about people that you love but when we transition sometimes people get super ugly and you're like wow well thanks for making that so clear uh don't need to hang around you anymore um so yeah does that make does that make sense it does yes now, before we get to the end, I do want to ask you um, about your dogs because uh, I've been able to hear them. So I'm curious uh, to know who they are and just a little about them. Well, I apologize. The reason the, bar- the barking that you hear is actually my neighbor's dog, but it's because <laughs> my dog, Bella, who is the most gorgeous um, half Weimaraner, half Pitbull, is staring down at her going, you stupid what is wrong with you? Yeah, this is a a family that moved in a couple of months ago and they have an Australian shepherd and I think it thinks that it's supposed to bark at whatever looks down. Now, my house looks down, so we clearly are in the position of like, man, you are really weird. But it hasn't stopped them from barking, so I apologize. Um, but Bella is the love of my life. Um, and I used to have, uh, her big sister was Aria and Aria passed away almost a year ago she went uh, the day after memorial day weekend last May. so bella's been an only child for a while and which means i'm spoiling the hell out of her so um she's very lucky <laughs> but so am i <laughs> of course <laughs> i love it is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners today yeah you know um uh, there's there's a couple of things. One is we're not our our genitals. We're not. Um, and and what uh, the reason why I'm saying that is because it it just keeps coming up. Even when I thought we had come up with um, some socially acceptable ways of of talking. <laughs> um, So in the same way that a cisgender person is not their genitals, um, understand that, that that's why that question is so offensive. Um, Because it's an othering, it's an instant othering that says, I don't understand you. And that's really weird. And this is going to sound like um, a oxymoron or a, dichotomy or I'm sure there's a phrase for what I'm about to say, but um, it's clear that transgender people and cisgender people are not the same. Um, There is a a fundamental lack of something in both of us of understanding because we look at cisgender people and go, man, you all are crazy. Like, how, why is that uh, a thought that you have, right? That's that it, it clearly blows our mind. Um, in the same way that you can't understand what it's like to be incongruent with your identity and your bodies, so much so that people think that you can have conversion therapy and we can fix it. It can't be fixed. It can't be prayed away. It can't be. It can't be um, uh, ignored. It can't be erased. It's not a choice. If it was a choice, why would we choose this? You've made it, not you, but people have made it so incredibly difficult that it hasn't changed us. We haven't, all we've learned is not to talk to you about it, but, but it hasn't changed who we are. It can't. It is fundamentally who we are. So we're not the same, but we are the same in that we are two species of human. We're all humans. And we need to get off of this idea that we can legislate us like cattle into a box canyon. And then what? You know, light it on fire and kill us all? Like, what? what, what, what is the end game? And so when... People have these, I'm just curious conversations, or I'm just asking, or, you know, it is a, it is a worthy thing. 
You know, the one thing that the, that's getting traction with the transgender girls sports ban is that people go, yeah, it's unfair to have someone who's a big, strong male competing against a little bitty girl. Well, ask Megan Rapino what she thinks about that. One of the greatest so women soccer players, one of the greatest soccer players, let's go that far. But she's the one who says, forget that. We don't need you. We don't need that kind of protection. So we're not protecting anybody. It's a it's a fulcrum that people who want to see us persecuted use. And it takes someone who thinks that a, an, a, an innocent question has been posed. Well, there's some merit to that. There isn't any at all. First of all, uh, especially because we're talking about high school students and, and collegiate athletes, high school students' bodies have not developed enough male or female, for one to have the, the inherent advantage over it. Now, it would be one thing if somebody really did beef up all their muscles, get you know all jacked up on testosterone, which is how boys in high school get as big as they get, as they're also taking hormones. Thank you very much. Um, and then have them transition, and now you've got super athlete, right? Well, that's not how it works. First of all, nobody would do that. They just wouldn't be able to do it. And if you think someone could survive transition having not been trans identified, then you're, I'll buy what you're smoking because it's some great stuff. <laughs> But it's really it's so I want people to understand that that it is a tactic that's designed to sway you with what sounds like it's logic, but it's really not because there's no logic behind it. And it is only hurtful. It's designed to hurt one of the most vulnerable populations in the country, in the world. So if you want to be a party to that by agreeing to participate in that charade, Look in the mirror and ask yourself, are you a good human? Because all we want to do is be good humans too. We want the same, we do want the same things. We want love. We want to be able to thrive. We want to be able to contribute. And that's a great last piece of advice. And for people to really hear, it's so important. Now, with all of my guests at the end, I do ask a random question that doesn't have anything to do with what we talked about, just something a little different. So my question for you is, how often do you find yourself daydreaming? Well, that's, um, that's a, first of all, it's a great question, but it's also a little unfair for you because I am a professional storyteller. I make my living by selling stories. And so I only daydream. <laughs> I, you know, maybe the question should be, how often do I, do I find myself typing down those daydreams? Because that's really, I'm always mulling. You know, right now I'm, I'm, I've got four different stories going on that are, I have a, an actual to-do list connected to it. But actually, idly, uh, which really daydreaming would be like where you just allow your or find yourself that your mind has drifted into a place of just delicious fantasy and or uh, mulling. Well, see, the other thing is I'm a meditator. So I do set aside time for this. So do I want to admit how many times I'm daydreaming while I'm meditating? <laughs> that's the, that's the telling question. Uh, I would say I probably spend more time in daydream than I do in regular dream or in regular awareness. I can't quantify it by time other than it's more, the ratio is higher in the daydream side than it is in, in the whatever that we call the other state. It's that state that everybody else does. <laughs> All right, that brings this episode to a close. As I mentioned, I will be leaving a link to Scotty Jeanette's
TED Talk. Uh, if you want to go check that out, along with links to her website and a link to her new upcoming documentary that is out very soon, if not already out, since the delay between recording and publishing. It's called Proud in a Pandemic. So that link will be there as well. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, our website is in the description. That brings you to all of our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you'd like to go follow those pages, I'd love the support. And of course, if you'd like to contact me, my email is right in the description to get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from you. And I love always meeting new guests. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily, that option is in the description as well. So thank you so much, Scotty Jeanette, for spending time with me today. And to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. And bye and be loving humans.